talk about um, additive manufacturing and in particular we're going to talk about uh, related additive manufacturing technologies so technologies that are complementary to additive manufacturing and can be used to support the process of uh, 3d printing and in particular we're going to talk about the process of reverse engineering how this can be used uh, when you don't have a, a digital file and the different systems, imaging systems, that uh, we can use in the process of reverse engineering, both uh, portable uh, devices, uh, so 3D scanning devices, as well as non-portable uh, devices. So, as you know, and as you've seen in the previous lectures, you normally need to start the process of 3D printing by generating a CAD file. That CAD file uh, is normally uh, converted into an SDL format, and that SEL format can then be sliced into um, homogeneous layers uh, that we normally call the SLI file. And this file is then transferred into a 3D printer so that we can physically reproduce our uh, 3D CAD model using one of the available systems, either an extrusion-based system or a VAT photopolymerization or a binder jetting or even powder bed fusion. But what happens if you don't have that digital support? For example, a skull that uh, someone might retrieve from an archeological site. You don't have a digital file uh, to actually use. Or uh, as it happens very often uh, when you work in product development, that you want to develop something based on already that, on something that's already exists. Like for example, this example of a mouse or a cup or any other product that you don't have a digital file, but you do have the physical product and you want to re-engineer that product. Or for example, uh, statues. So things that you don't have a digital support that exists uh, physically, but you need that computer uh, design file to create an STL file and then slice it and then print it using a 3D printing system. So what can we do in these cases? And the solution very often is to apply the concept of uh, reverse engineering, which as the name indicates is exactly that as going backwards. So we start from the physical object and then we go back and try to generate and obtain our CAD file. So for example, models can be built from generated data using this reverse engineering approach and in particular using 3D imaging equipment and obviously associated software. So in simple terms, reverse engineering is the process of capturing geometric data from a physical object. This data, uh, and this is important, usually uh, initially uh, is, is initially available um, in what is normally termed as a point cloud form. So meaning that uh, it's basically an unconnected set of points representing uh, the surface of the object. And this is also important. So you don't have any information about the inside of the product. So it only captures the surface of, uh, the, of, your, uh, of your product. And this is a, a, an example of reverse engineering. So in this case, we have a mouse that we don't have a digital support. What we do in this case, we do a 3D scanning of the object, and we'll show you how this can be done. We obtain then this point cloud form, which basically contains all the information about the surface of the object. And then this is converted into a mesh and automatically uh, converted into this CAD file, which is then your, your digital uh, support to then uh, generate the SCL file, slice it and print it. So as you can see here in this diagram, uh, you start from the physical object, you scan it, convert it into a CAD file, and then using this CAD file, you can print it as it is, or you can introduce modifications in the design of your product and then print this part using uh, 3D printing. And uh, key to this reverse engineering approach are these imaging or so-called imaging systems. And there, are, there is a wide range of imaging systems. There are these non-portable uh, devices, like for example, computer uh, tomography. This is based on X-ray uh, technology. In this case, 
and different from all of the other imaging systems, this can capture both surface information as well as information about the inside or the interior of your parts. Like for example, the porosity uh, and the volume uh, to surface ratio. So these are uh, top hand systems called microcomputer uh, tomography and can be used not just to reconstruct uh, physical objects, but also to obtain information about um, the, the, the interior of your parts. Like for example, detecting internal defects like porosity in casted parts. CMM machines are also quite common in the industry in order to reverse engineer products. Uh, a difference from computer tomography, this is normally based on uh, contact uh, probes. So there is a probe that is mounted on this three axis machine and this probe will scan your parts and obtain the point cloud uh, form that you need to then reverse engineer and obtain your CAD file. Less uh, costly equipments and also with less resolution are these so-called portable uh, 3D scanners. And there is, there is a wide range of these systems available with very, with very uh, different prices. So you can obtain and you can buy uh, this uh, 3D system called uh, iSense. It can be adapted to your iPad and you can use this to uh, capture images from uh, physical objects and use that to reverse engineer products. Uh, this, uh, the resolution of these systems is not uh, very high, but it allows you to obtain geometrical data that you can then use to model your products. Another technology also based on uh, laser scanning are these uh, 3D portable scanners. These have much higher resolution when compared to this iSense system. Uh, and they use the same uh, approach. Basically, they use a camera and scanners to uh, actually irradiate the surface of your objects and capture all the geometrical data that you can then convert into uh, a physical uh, product. So how does uh, this whole process work? So what we're gonna show you next in a, is an example of a 3D scanner. Uh, which is a portable scanner, but can also be mounted in this tripod and that can be used to scan uh, 3D products. This is something that is available in our uh, 3D printing lab. And Chris Eaton is gonna talk to you about this reverse engineering process using laser scanners. And he will illustrate this with a video. And then we will show you also the entire process of scanning with the systems that we have available in our uh, school. So I'll hand it over to Chris now. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so we use this scanner um, to scan parts which are quite complex to draw on SolidWorks. So if you were to draw this part which is being scanned on the video, it's going to take you a long time. It's quite difficult to, to measure and draw that. So we use this scanner um, to then scan the part for you and it will then, it will turn it into an STL file. So as you can see on, on the video, you can see the light, the light flashes, it's, it's bouncing back off the model and it's then putting the, the finished scan onto the screen. And you can see in the top left hand corner, you can see the, the scan. Um, so that is, you can then decide how many turns you want to do. So if you want it to be a really complex scan, you could do 180 turns. So it can go one, two, three, and so on, but you'd be there all day. So what we tend to do is we just do 20 turns of this turntable. Um, so then you can see how it's being projected onto the laptop. Um, once you've done the finished scan, you have to turn it over so many times because the light can't get underneath. So as you can see on the video, it's flat. Um, you're gonna have to then turn it over at a right angle and then rescan 20 times, turn it over, rescan, um, and it will mesh all your scans into one complete model. And then you can then save that as an STL file and you can import that onto SolidWorks, which then you can then put into your 3D printing software and, you, and you, you'll be able to go ahead and print that. 
Um, so this is basically what the video is showing you. Uh, after the video, we will do a live scan. So I've got this in my hand. I will scan, I'll share my screen and you'll see the software. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'll just like to point out, uh, as you can see here in the video, we've got this uh, rotational platform. And as Chris was just mentioning to you, this is going to rotate um, a certain angle and that allows the 3D scanner to capture the entire part. Obviously, because the part is sitting on this flat surface, you won't be able to capture the bottom of your part. So you need to turn it and then do the scanning again in order to capture the entire uh, surface of your part. Also, importantly, the scanner needs to know where your part is in terms of the uh, 3D spatial uh, positioning of your part. And that's why you have these white dots on the surface of the platform. So these are basically used to triangularize the light that will irradiate your object and your platform. And with that, the scanner knows the exact special position of your uh, surface or the different surfaces of your parts. And this is an important step in terms of uh, scanning. You need to provide references to the scanner to know where the part is in uh, space. If you were doing this without this platform, so if you were scanning, for example, a skull that was buried, you wouldn't have this rotational platform with all uh, these markers. So you would need to put that in your uh, parts, in the part that you are scanning. So these markers would need to be attached to the surface of your parts so that the scanner could triangularize the lasers and know where your part is um, in, in space. And also uh, another important thing is the control of the environment. So the light is extremely important. So you remember that you are working with um, a, a laser-based scan and the resolution and the scanning process is influenced by uh, the light intensity that you normally have in your room. So controlling the light is also something very important if you want to obtain a scanning with uh, good definition. And uh, Chris will talk to you also uh, about that when he shares his, um, his screen. So all of these are systems that we use in our workshops when we don't have a digital support uh, for a specific product. And we want to create that CAD file that will allow us then to either change the geometry of our parts, the dimensions, to redesign it, and then print it using um, FDM or SLA or any other additive manufacturing system. So I'll, I'll stop sharing now. And uh, Chris will talk you through uh, the software and will show you how this scanning process can be used and once it's finished, how can you export that information directly into the software of the 3D printing system? And this is uh, something that normally you would be able to do in our additive manufacturing labs that were part of this unit. But unfortunately, because of the COVID restrictions this year, this will not be possible. However, you're still gonna be able to uh, visualize that, the reverse engineering process, and also, um, through some of the, the, the asynchronous videos that we're going to post on Blackboard, you're going to see everything that it's needed to be done after you get the scanning to actually set up the printing, uh, manufacture the parts and all the post-processing. Then if you've got any questions regarding the 3D scanning or the reverse engineering or the actual 3D printing process, please do feel free to contact uh, Chris through the discussion board or during your surgery sessions with Chris that should appear on your uh, timetable. Chris, I believe you should be able to, um, I think we've got a question, Sebastian. Yes. Um, please. 
going to say that the platform looks slightly small. So how would you go about scanning a much bigger object? Uh, yes. It's handheld as well. So it's not only platform based. You can take the scanner and you could scan a full car. You could scan a full person. Um, but you have to put the marker points that Marco was saying. So you have to stick, you probably see them like a, they're like a, a white and black dot and you can stick them all over the part you want to scan. Um, and it's do exactly the same as the turntable, but it's a handheld scan. So um, the, only, the, only, the only downside to handheld scanning is it picks up the background. So you have to start editing the background. So it's good to do uh, handheld scans behind a backdrop, say, so like a white screen which will stop in the background. Um, but yeah, you can do handheld and turntable. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. If there are any more questions, feel, please feel free to raise your hand or uh, we can also go through those questions at the end of the lecture, okay? Okay, ready? Uh, just hang on. Uh, I think Basel, Basel, do you have a question as well? Uh, yeah, I just have a question. Is it harder to scan uh, an, an object if it's dark because it absorbs uh, more light? Uh, yeah, what, what we have, we have, um, we have a, a spray. Uh, it's like a developer. So anything that is a dark object or a shiny object, we spray with this white chalk. So it, 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 it goes onto your part wet, but then it, as, it, as it dries, it turns into powder, like a white powder. So I've chosen a white part to scan, so we have to spray it. Um, but yeah, you, you can spray, and the spray is safe to go onto onto objects or even even skin. It is a safe um, spray, so we we do use. Um, I don't know if you can see. I turn the lights off, but um, that's the spray we use to um, to spray the object white. Right. Yeah. Thanks. I think we've got another question. Yeah. Um, so um, you said, sir, that the white and black dots, if you were scanning a car, could be put onto the car so it's easier to scan. Yeah. So does that mean that the white and black dots, they can be placed not just for the ground, it can be on anything that's difficult to scan? Anything that's um, complex to scan. So anything such as a, a large car, the handheld scanner will want to pick up everything it can see. So background, um, even stuff nearby. Um, so if you've got the marker points, it automatically zones in to the marker points so it knows just to scan that section. Um, but you can you don't have to scan the whole car in one go. You can scan a section, you can press pause, and then you can come back to it and scan the other section, and then it merges it all together. So it doesn't affect anything. You have to do it all in one go because you'll be there all day. You can scan it in parts. And sections as long as you've got your marker points um it's perfectly fine so for the product which is in the top left on the screen yeah it's it's not on the product it's underneath the product yeah uh, because that's, it's on the turn, because it's on the turntable you don't need marker points on the actual job because the marker points are on the turntable for you you see oh, so the light will be concentrated towards so, the so points. Can, you, can you see where it's flashing red okay yeah that is the brightness hence why i've asked to turn my lights off um because the part has to have mostly, not, not completely red like that, because it won't scan, okay? Right. It has to have a, a little bit of uh, brightness on, on there. But what that's doing is, it's not looking at the part, it's looking at the, the points. But it's where it can't see the points, that's where it's creating the scan. Yeah, so may I just add to that? So the markers are basically used as a referencing system, okay? so. Uh, it, it's basically, it helps directing the lasers to the region of interest, so the region that you want to scan. And if you have a platform, you can place those markers on the platform where the part that you want to scan is also um, based. But if you don't have that platform, uh, obviously you don't have a referencing system, so the scanner doesn't know what is the region of interest that you want uh, to scan. And in that case, as you were mentioning before, if it's, for example, uh, a car that doesn't fit one of these platforms, you'll need to put the, the, the markers, the referencing system on the part itself, okay? So the, the, the laser to, to actually be able to scan 
your parts and to understand where that part is in 3D, it needs these referencing points that can be placed either on a platform where the part is also uh, placed or on the parts uh, if you don't have that rotational platform. Sorry, Chris. Okay, thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, so this is- Are there any other questions? Sorry. I think we do have another question. Uh, yes, I just have one question uh, for complex parts. You said we have to place the dots on the, the part itself. Is there a specific uh, protocol to the, uh, so as to where to place them or can you place them uh, in no. any fashion? You stick them wherever you want. There's no, you can stick them all next to each other if you like. You're just using more dots, more markers, that's all. There's no, I found you can space them. I have tried it. I've tried using scanning one part with nice even markers i've tried scanning it everywhere and it does the same job so i've cancelled that out okay thank you sorry if you allow me to contribute hi hi grace hi all hi. Uh, i was, I was using a handheld laser scanner in, in the lab uh, at the university to uh, measure in process welding and although it was a fairly simple part it was actually plates because it had 90 degrees angles it was quite challenging more challenging to capture this geometry rather than a sculpt you know a sculpted uh, surface yeah so yeah i found that you know if you place you know you have to place more markers close to the edges and make sure that the handheld laser scanner sees at least three dots three markers at the same time otherwise it gets confused so three yeah. three three references at the same time yeah. i think it's a, a a key it depends what brand and what maker scanner you're using uh, i yeah. found this scanner uh -huh. seems to be happy picking up markers wherever they're based um it all depends on the make and the model and the, uh, mm -hmm. the age you know you, you have some really good scanners you have some really bad scanners so yeah that's right I don't know how much that one, but this, this one, you're looking at 20, 25,000 pounds plus for this scanner, so. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Brilliant. Thanks, Anastasia. Chris, if, you, if you'd like to, to proceed and, and, and okay, show yeah. how the okay, process so works. I'll go through. So this is when you open up the software, this is what, this is what it'll greet you with. Um, this is your screen which the scanner is pointing at you can see you've got like a, a target so uh, as long as the your part is within within screenshot basically you don't it can't be off screen because it won't pick it up uh, and then this is your scan settings so with turntable which is a turntable if i was doing handheld i don't take that and i'll take that one um, these are your turntable steps, so you can go for between four and 180 turns, like I said before. So you could do four turns, you could one, two, three, four, and then that's your scan done, but it's not very accurate. It's, it's only for something quick. Um, so I find 20 turns is, is reasonable enough to, to pick up a decent scan. Then so please, the, 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 more, the more turns you do, the higher will be the definition that you get. Yeah, the higher scanning. resolution, yeah. yeah. So if you do 180 turns, you know, you'll be there a while, but you're going to get a really, really in-depth, high-resolution scan. Um, but you're not that interested in that much of a high resolution because you can change that on the 3D printing software, you see. So you just want a basic, a basic scan. So you've got the turntable coded targets, which is actually on the turntable. You know, if I untick that, it wouldn't pick that up and it wouldn't scan. Um, but the markers is, is when you're doing handheld. So it's the same, same thing, but it has to know whether it's turntable or it's handheld. That's all that, that, all that is. So um, it's in progress now. So if I just press play, uh, you can't see the scan to my left, but you can see, you'll see on the screen. So you'll see this move in a second, one resolution. So there you go. So it's moved now and that's where it's picked up straight away. On its first on its first turn and it's going to do 20 turns um chris so. this, this is actually the part that you've they've shown to us before That's the part right? in my, was in my hand a minute ago yeah and the part that was on the video chris in terms in terms of uh, setting up the lights um yeah. 
what it, what is normally the you know the, the normal sets up that you need to have in order to perform the scanning? Um, well, you need a dark room basically. That they, they want it needs to be as dark as possible so it can pick up your part. But like I said before, you can adjust the brightness here where my mouse is now. Um, so if your room isn't so dark, you can change that on the scanner. But sometimes that can throw up errors. So um, this 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 darkness now is 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 ideal for this scanner. So can you see when when the scanner turns itself off, the whole screen goes black because it's that dark. Right. So I think we had that? a. I think we had a question. I think we can take that question whilst we're doing the the scanning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and also, can you see where it's yellow? Anywhere where it's yellow, it's not picked up on the scanner. So that's where you need to, when this 20 scans is finished, you need to turn it on, its, on an angle and then rescan. So you need to make sure your part has no yellow whatsoever. If you, if you have any yellow on, on your part, it won't print. It'll just print a big blob. So it has to make, you have to make sure you've got all the yellow covered. That's why you can do as many as many scans as you like, as long as you've got no yellow. It has to be completely blue. Chris, can we take a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry. I can't see the hand raised. Hi. Yeah, so no idea. Is there a point where the number of turns you do um, becomes like, say, negligible? So it doesn't matter if you do like one or two more turns, you're going to get the same result. Uh, as in, if I repeated this scan? Without... Um, so let's say you did 20 turns, you'd yeah. get a lot finishing scan than if you did 100 turns um but is there a is it like a set number where if you do 100 turns you're going to do you're going to have the same resolution let's say 150 turns um I, I, i've never gone that that far into doing that many turns so i wouldn't know i've only I, I, the furthest i've gone to is 80 turns when i was scanning i think uh, i can i can answer that yeah. so Obviously, this is an optimization process. Uh, so you normally start with uh, a low number of, of, of turnings, you know, the, um, and, and there, there is no set number for that. So you could potentially start, like as Chris started now, with 20 turns, which won't take you a lot of time. Uh, but then you would need to see if you'd need more turns or not, depending on um, the ability of the scanner to capture the surface of your object. So like Chris was saying, these yellow parts here, they're not being captured. Or for example, if you'd see that some of the angles, some of these sharp corners were not being captured, you would need to increase the number of turns in order to get a well-defined uh, surface geometry. So there is not a set number, it's an optimization process. So you're trying to uh, use a number of steps that won't increase the scanning time too much but at the same time you want to make sure that you get a good uh, resolution and definition of your part perfect thank you okay so as you can see we've only scanned the top section on the le top left hand side okay so it cannot pick underneath up so underneath it hasn't got a clue what's there so if i were to say okay that's fine it will just not print it'll just make it it'll, it'll automatically fill in the yellow where it thinks best so what you do now is you then turn your model over, completely over. So this is this will be on the turntable bed and the under, underside will be showing. And all you do, in fact, I can do it now. Because okay, you so do that. I've turned that over now. Out. Okay, it's not quite on the screen. Okay, so if I... Um, press that, the edit, and then if I press start scan again now, it will now pick up the underside. And the reason, if I may, Chris, the reason why you were able to do this without losing what you have scanned before, it's because of those reference markers. Yeah. Because the laser knows exactly the, the part that is uh, being scanned, okay? Okay, so that, that, that's gone wrong, okay? Because I didn't have it on the screen properly. So I have, to, I have to now remove that scan, but you've still got your scan from previous. It still remembers the previous scan. So that, that, that is good. Um, so you have to restart the whole scan, basically. So um, yeah, so once 
once you've scanned all your parts, you know, top, left, bottom, middle, center, it'll it'll merge all your scans together, and then you can go through and you can mesh your model. So if it's for 3D printing, you want it watertight. Uh, you know, I can't go much further because it takes such a long time to mesh to mesh this model. Um, Can we just explain, Chris, what this mesh is? Yeah, the, the mesh is it's where it, it fills in the the model, so it's 100% watertight. So if you were to print it, it will print a solid model rather than print it in triangle. Um, do you know the STL file? It will print yeah. a solid piece. So um, we'll do low detail, but it will take it will take a while. Um, okay, maybe whilst doing this, so I, if, if you remember, we didn't go very much in detail about that in the first lecture, but we'll talk about that. So what the STL file is, it's basically uh, contains information about the surface. And the information that is contained is um, about the triangles that will compose the entire surface. So when you scan an object and you obtain all these clouds, then you need to connect them. And you need to create these triangularized surfaces that contain information about uh, the spatial positioning of each of these triangles. So when you have this information, then you can use it to slice the object and print it. And the machine that you're gonna be using to print knows exactly where to place each material to represent that specific geometrical feature of your parts. So it's basically triangularizing to know where your surface is and where do you need to print that specific geometric information, okay? I think we have a couple of questions. I think whilst we're doing the mashing, we can take those questions. Um, anyone wants to go first? I think we have one question here. Hi, sir. A um, couple of things I was, I was curious about. Um, when you're spinning it with, no matter how many rotations you go through, will it always, in the end, go through a full 360 degree cycle? Yes. So it's just yeah. the, matter, it's the number. It's of just the increment. Yeah. It's just the increment in terms of, of, of the angles that uh, is, is rotating, okay? But it will always go um, a full rotation, okay? So it will always go 360 degrees. You will need to scan uh, the entire part. And the reference markers, um, those are like the boundaries of where to stop the scan? Those are basically targets, okay? So that's the laser uh, when uh, irradiating the surface so that he knows uh, where the part is, and um, if you move the part for any reason, for example, if you need to turn it around, you won't lose those reference points, okay? And then you will be able to merge the different scanners uh, that you will do. So it's just basically a referencing system. What, to act, what, like, almost like a graph? Almost like that, yes. Act like an axis? Yeah, absolutely. And so, um, what did you mean when you said a couple minutes ago about triangulate? So when, when you're scanning, so you've got your, um, your model, your digital model. What this meshing does is to fill in the entire surface with triangles. They are close or next to each other, okay? So they share uh, angles uh, together. And the vertices are also common to these triangles. So it's basically triangularizing the entire surface. And then each triangle has a normal uh, vector. So with this information, then you know exactly where um, your part is in space in 3D. Because then you need to send that information to the printer and the printer needs to replicate that in 3D. And without that information, it's not going to be able to place material where it needs to be placed and will not be able to reproduce the geometry of your parts as you've designed it. It needs that, uh, let's put it in simple terms, that coordinate, uh, coordinate system to know where to print and what to print um, in terms of geometry, surface geometry. So the, tr it, so the scanner's scanning in sets of triangles which are all connected together by the vertices? No, it, it connects, it, it scans the surface 
and it gathers this cloud of points, okay? It's basically just points. So imagine the surface of your object just being um, a cloud of points that are not connected. What the meshing does is connecting that points and arranging that as a triangularized surface. Right. Are the as, when you say that triangular, is that all they're, they're all like equal actual tri triangles, or it's different between each points? No, they're Just all so they're all they're all the same. But you can increase the number of triangles, and as you increase the number of triangles, the higher will be your resolution. Because more triangles means more points. Absolutely, it will yeah. be. But you more can see coordinate. on the screen on your left hand side where the mouth is now. That's how many triangles in that one scan alone. Just that one scan. But if you were to increase the turns, that would that would dramatically increase. So you get more more triangles, more points, better resolution. Okay, thank you very much. But also bear in mind that more triangles mean also more processing time. Yeah. So do you remember when you, when it was yellow underneath and we didn't, and we didn't scan the bottom and I said it would automatically fill in what it thinks the best way to do it. That's what it's done underneath. That, so that's, that's not why you've got that mess over there. Yeah, I mean, that'll go. That'll go when you. That'll go when you've turned it over and you've rescanned it, and all the yellows disappeared. So that's what I was trying to explain. That's that's a that's a good scan for the top side, but a bad scan for the bottom side because we never did that. So if I were to print that, that's how it'd come out because it doesn't know. Thank so you very much. It's just guessed. It's just it's just filled it in best it could. Um. So yeah. So once you save this. You can go ahead and save that. So you've got to do save it onto your USB. It will, it will automatically save as an STL file. And then you open up the printing software. And this is the printing software. So this, this is, a, this is a, a scan that I did earlier on all the way around. OK. Uh, yeah. Chris, I think we're not seeing the, the scan that oh, you've done before. Sorry. Let me, I'll have to stop sharing and I'll, okay. I'll share that screen. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me know when you can see that. Yeah, we can see that now. Okay, so this is the uh, the 3D printing software now. This is the, the Cura uh, for the Ultimaker. So I did this scan earlier on today, four or five times, all the way around, upside down, sideways. Um, struggle to get inside there. That's where it's a bit a bit dodgy in there, but that's not that's not a problem. The main thing we want to see is how it's scanned externally. Uh, and it's, it's scanned really well. So anywhere where it's red, it means that it needs support building on this platform. But we have a support called natural PVA, which you can just dissolve in water rather than peel it off and make a mess of your job. Uh, so when, when, I, when, I scat, when I did the slice of the job, anywhere where it's white is, is the support of the PVA. But you don't have to worry about peeling that off. If you just put that in water, come back the next day. That's all disappeared, and you're left with your part. Chris, th yep. this is a this is an extrusion-based system, a fuse opposition yeah. modeling system, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is this is layer by layer. So we're doing 0.2 millimeter layer height. So every every layer is 0.2. Uh, where ev everywhere where you can see yellow is the actual PLA material. Um, I can't get on there at the moment for some reason. There you go. So can you see it's generic PLA? That's the yellow, and the the white is the PVA. So this is it's building now, layer by layer. That's how it's going to build. So a couple of things that are important to to mention uh, in here. So when you import this into the printing software of the system. Depending on uh, the orientation of the parts, uh, so if, if you place it as Chris did, or if you change the orientation, this will also influence um, the need for uh, support structures. So every time you have these overhanging structures, you will need something to support it whilst you are, uh, you are building the parts so that they don't um, crash. Depending on the orientation of the parts, you may need more or less support structures, okay? 
Uh, and this is normally deposited by a different printing head. So you have a printing head that will print with the material that you're going to use to manufacture the part. And another printing head will deposit this polyvinyl alcohol material to support your uh, building construct. And once it's printed, as Chris was mentioning, then you'll have to do the post-processing, which basically means that you have to remove the parts from the building platform and dissolve, in this case, the support structures that don't make part of the, of the, of the product that you are printing. Uh, and then, uh, depending on the requirements, you might need to do also some surface finishing, some polishing, some painting, depending on, uh, on the application of your, of your part. Um, so this is, this is something important. It's how you define the orientation, you always try to minimize the number of support structures because that has a negative impact on the building time and also on the overall cost of your product. So reducing the support structures or the number of support structures will reduce the building time and also the overall cost of your parts, okay? But this is something that we will go in detail with the asynchronous videos that we'll make available through uh, Blackboard. But also, after you watch those videos, please come back to the surgery sessions and uh, interact with Chris and make any questions that you'd like to, to make about this printing process. And how can you potentially use these systems, both the, both the, the scanning as the printing machines in the future for your uh, own projects? Um, we do have other questions. Um, I think we can take some questions now. Oh. Hi, Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, uh, I just got a, a quick question. Uh, if the, the technology improves on this and makes it a lot more affordable for small companies, would there be any use in actually using SolidWorks at all? Well, uh, that's actually a very, uh, a very good question. And there is probably not SolidWorks, so one of the things that we've mentioned in one of the previous les uh, lectures is that the, the CAD software that is currently available, either SolidWorks or Inventa or other systems, they were not designed to work with additive manufacturing. So they were uh, generated to actually work with uh, conventional manufacturing systems. And the design for additive manufacturing has different requirements. So answering your question, yes, there will be a need uh, still a need for computer data design softwares, okay? Uh, because you might want to design something from scratch, uh, but the systems or the software will need to be adapted and improved in order to work with uh, additive manufacturing systems. And basically, because additive manufacturing systems can use multiple materials, so we can print multiple materials, we can print in colors, but mainly because we have a freedom of geometry that we don't have with conventional manufacturing and computer data design softwares need to be adapted to actually allow you to fully explore the freedom of design that additive manufacturing uh, provides you. Okay, thank you, that answers my question. 